Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Mustafa Yar Hiraj and it is my distinct honor to be serving as president of the LSCSU Pakistan Development Society. Um, everybody, uh, this is panel number two for the LSE Future of Pakistan Conference 2020 and the subject of, so the subject of today's discussion is foreign policy. Uh, without further delay, I am now pleased to introduce our second panel and we will, this panel will deliberate on the implications of the future relations between Pakistan and the United States. How will a Biden-Harris administration influence the Indian occupation of Kashmir? Saddam Masood Khan joined the Foreign Service of Pakistan back in 1980 and has been posted on several diplomatic missions around the world. He served as the spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 2003, after which he became Pakistan's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations and international organizations in Geneva. Switzerland from 2005 to 2008. Afterwards, he was assigned the portfolio of ambassador to China from 2008 to 2012. Sardar Masood Khan also had the opportunity of serving as Pakistan's permanent representative to the UN in New York from 2012 to 2015, and even headed the Institute of Strategic Studies as its director general before he became president of Azad Jammu and Kashmir. It is an honor to host President Saddam Masood Khan at the LSE Future of Pakistan Conference 2020, and we believe that his diplomatic expertise, as well as his current position as a representative of Kashmir, make him a perfect fit for our panel. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> I think that this initiative that has been taken by Mr. Hiraj is commendable, and it is good to interact with the students because uh, the young people in Pakistan constitute the bulk of our population. According to a survey that was conducted back uh, in 2015, uh, it was conducted by UNDP, 64% of uh, Pakistani population is below the age of 30. Uh, <clears throat> so that is about 130 to 140 million people. And uh, they have to deal with the United States now and in the years to come. So that's why this is very important initiative and I really appreciate it. Second, uh, I think that uh, the US-Pakistan relationship is very vital and uh, it has been so for the past seven decades. It has had a cyclical pattern. In fact, at one point we were called the most allied ally of the United States and at one point we were the most sanctioned nation uh, we, we, against which United States Senate and House of Representatives slapped a series of sanctions. So, but uh, we must recognize that this relationship is very, very important, whether or not we like it. Um, so let me take you back to 2016 when President Trump was uh, elected. At that time, from the point of view of the Democrats, there was some unfinished agenda vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan and India. And uh, there is some speculation whether or not uh, the new administration, the new democratic ad administration led by Mr. Ba Mr. Biden, whether this administration would be the third Obama administration. My own view is there is going to be a new administration. It would have its own uh, singular uh, unique fingerprint and it would like to distinguish itself from the Obama administration, the two administrations that were led by President Obama. Now, what was the finished agenda? As a matter of fact, I mean, um, at that time, I mean, uh, the United States, uh, its negotiators and its uh, high officials were breathing down our necks, uh, saying that we should freeze our nuclear program, particularly short range um, delivery vehicles and short, short uh, these tactical nuclear weapons. This was the agenda at that time. And uh, otherwise, the formal talks, the so-called strategic dialogue between the United States and Pakistan had been suspended. There's another cluster of nuclear dialogue, which was called Triple S and NP. This was also suspended. But the US diplomats were quite active on pressuring Pakistan to abandon its uh, nuclear development, especially, as I mentioned, um, short range delivery vehicles and uh, nu uh, tactical nuclear weapons. But uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, in 2016, again, I would say between the Obama administration and the then government of uh, Pakistan, there was 
huge misunderstanding in regard to Haqqani group or the role of uh, the so-called militant organizations in Pakistan and their interference in, in Afghanistan's internal affairs and so on. And so these were the two items. Of course, Simon, when it came to Kashmir or uh, other issues between India and Pakistan, the United States at that point uh, chose to look the other way. So the reason I have given you this background is that uh, we started, or the governments at that time, started off with the Trump administration um, uh, on a good note, as a matter of fact, I mean, because uh, there was an engagement in the beginning and that culminated in the uh, meeting between the current prime minister and President Trump um, in Washington, D.C., and uh, there were many surprises. Of course, there was a rapprochement at that time between the two sides. Uh, before that, there was uh, um, a misunderstanding on a host of issues, but uh, two surprises, of course. I mean, one was not a surprise that we came closer in regard to Afghanistan. And the second was that uh, uh, President Trump at that point offered mediation on Kashmir and he said that he had been prompted by Narendra Modi to do so. Although when he made this claim, the following day, uh, India's external affairs ministry rejected that statement of President Trump. And so later on, when President Trump talked about mediation, um, he equivocated, he tried to introduce an artificial balance between Pakistan and India and uh, so he was no good faith negotiator. Uh, later on, it came very clear. Um, it became very clear. So now <coughs> let me tell you that uh, uh, in 2017, you'll have to go back to 2017 uh, when uh, President Trump had very angrily paused all um, assistance, security assistance to Pakistan. And uh, the US propagandists, in fact, exaggerated the amount of uh, um, assistance that had been given to Pakistan. Uh, in total, it was about $33 billion, out of which 18 billion were economic assistance in one form or the other. And the rest was the services rendered by you know, our armed forces or the logistical support that we had given to the United States. That was, in fact, that amount was compensation for the services that we had rendered. So the task right now is for the Biden administration, our engagement with the Biden administration is to understand the Biden administration. Let me tell you that uh, uh, there are lots of expectations from the Biden administration, President Biden himself and uh, um, Kamala Harris. They have given statements in support of the rights of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. They already, I mean, President uh, Biden recognize the role Pakistan has played uh, in the context of Afghanistan. Um, the Trump administration recognized that and they, now this uh, um, administration, new administration knows that without Pakistan's assistance and facilitation, uh, Taliban would not have showed up on the negotiation tables. So <clears throat> that's a plus that we are starting with. Uh, but uh, let me also tell you that uh, we will have to reset our relationship because for all practical purposes, uh, the uh, content of the relationship between Pakistan and United States had been eviscerated or it had been diluted during the Trump administration and we had become Afghanistan specific state. So although I'm in some in this current financial year 2020, some very minimal amount in the form of assistance has been allocated for Pakistan. Now, <clears throat> our expectations, you, you're talking about, I mean, I talked about that high watermark between uh, the current government in Pakistan and President Trump, and that was uh, the year 2019. And after that, we saw the developments in Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir um, concerning uh, these illicit uh, or first this invasion and occupation of the territory, then of course, illicit transfer of population and so on. So uh, that, that uh, mediation offer came to naught, came to nothingness. Now, let me tell you that what should be our agenda. First is that uh, 
right now the Indian Americans, the influential Indian Americans in the Democratic Party or in the uh, civil services structure, they have all the academia, they've already encircled the Biden administration and they have swamped it at various tiers. So that has to be understood clearly. We have to see whether Pakistani expatriates or Pakistani Americans have same sort of uh, ingress into the democratic power corridors or power hierarchy. Uh, they are also very active. I think they should be about 1 million Pakistani Americans, ballpark figure, of course, some say that it's 700,000. Indians are 3 million to 4 million. Now, <clears throat> this is a very important factor, the diaspora community factor, because they influence decision-making that impinges on uh, uh, security of South Asia, directly or indirectly. Now, let me talk about Afghanistan. I think that uh, uh, President Trump is leaving behind a mess in Afghanistan. And uh, so they have to, the, the Biden administration has to find a way uh, to re-engage and to sort of minimize the losses that they would inherit. Uh, I think that Pakistan would remain a key player, um, but I would say that even after the pullout of the U.S. troops, Pakistan would see uh, turbulence in Afghanistan, and Pakistan has to be ready to deal with that kind of political turbulence and a spillover to Pakistan's territory. So uh, I won't say that this would be a repeat of the uh, 1990s, but something akin to that is likely to happen. On Kashmir, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm only very cautious about it because, uh, yes, uh, uh, President Biden has made statements about Kashmir and about the rise of the Kashmiris. Kamala Harris very famously said that, Kashmiris, you are not alone, we are with you. And uh, such uh, statements really reassured Kashmiris and the uh, hard remarks were applauded in Pakistan. But I would say at the same time that there are two or three possibilities. One, I mean, we can ask questions. Would uh, President Biden or his designee, any of his designees play the role of mediation? And I would rule that out because usually serving presidents do not act as mediators. Usually they do not. Uh, President Trump uh, was very confident that he was past master in um, transactions and making deals and therefore he could do that. Uh, but uh, they could play a role in the Security Council because now that Pakistan has presented the issue of Jammu and Kashmir back to the Security Council, uh, United Nations is a preeminent nation and as a permanent member of the Security Council can play a pivotal role there. Second, would the United States uh, intervene uh, and dissuade India from killing Kashmiris, or I would say simply human beings there, because uh, there's genocide taking place in Kashmir and there's Lebensraum uh, unfolding there because uh, in the past four months, um, uh, the Indian occupation authorities have imported or transferred about 2.2 million people into the occupied territory. And this is an outrage, but uh, nobody has uh, called out India. Nobody who matters. I mean, of course, parliaments have been speaking up, but not uh, uh, the U.S. government or, uh, or uh, others, for instance, other veto-wielding powers. So this is a crisis. My expectations are lower at the, at, the, at the moment. But I would say this would depend on our advocacy and our outreach. And uh, this kind of outreach should not be confined to the government level. It should be... Uh, I mean, non-governmental sector should be involved in it, particularly civil society. And in regard to Kashmir, we should reach out to the U.S. citizenry so that we turn this Kashmir movement into a civil rights movement. Uh, <clears throat> let me briefly talk about that, uh, you know, China would be a big factor uh, between Pakistan and the United States. And somehow we have to tell the United States that uh, our close cooperation with China is uh, not detrimental to the United States. Um, easier said than done because uh, uh, the Trump administration and uh, their followers, they have whipped up this negative sentiment against China and against Pakistan because we are implementing the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So our agenda, uh, as it was said by um, uh, Ms. Hina Rabani Kerr, that our 
agenda should not be US specific um, because uh, Pakistan is a big country. Pakistan has a strategic location. Pakistan has multiple responsibilities. So what we should do is that we should uh, conceive a holistic approach towards our foreign policy or national security where multiple actors um, are available to us for uh, consultation and for building relationships. So in that context, I mean, this China factor, which is one of the most crucial and sensitive subjects has to be handled very skillfully. Uh, our relations with the um, um, United States should also be expanded to economic cooperation, uh, educational sphere also, because uh, our students are not getting admission in hardcore subjects like uh, or basic sciences or natural sciences. And uh, this is a huge deficit because, uh, and India has an advantage because hundreds of thousands of Indian students are studying in the United States and the United States still has the cutting edge technology. Uh, we mustn't forget that. Uh, in regard to the nuclear policy, I think that, uh, you know, what has happened over the year, we must understand it very clearly, that because of the massive and effective penetration of Indian American um, leaders and politicians and civil servants and bankers and academics into the US system. Now, United States, uh, by default, and at times by design, does the bidding of New Delhi, India. And New Delhi's messages are conveyed to us via Washington DC. Now, this is a, and this, this is not fair because uh, in, you know, uh, United States has started seeing Pakistan through the prism of New Delhi. And that complicates our relationship. Some people have asked whether we should get hyphenated again with India. I've said there's no need of high hyphenation. Pakistan is a uh, big boy, is a big adult country, and therefore it should stand on its own and have direct engagement with the United States on merits. Um, but uh, in that context, uh, if the um, new government restarts that process of uh, giving entry to India in the nuclear supplies group, we should resist it. And we had successfully done so till 2016. This whole process started uh, during the Bush administration and culminated during the Obama presidency. And they were about to give formal entry to India in the nuclear supplies group. If India enters in the nuclear supplies group, that is curtains for Pakistan. So, I mean, we should be very, very clear about that. Um, another subject which uh, has to be dealt with very, uh, very skillfully is Islamophobia. I call it uh, this rising tide of uh, anti-Islamism and anti-Muslimism. I mean, to be much more candid, Islam, Islam is nothing to be dreaded or feared as the term Islamophobia suggests. Now, uh, United States and its churches and its evangelists and its civil society, they can play a constructive role in promoting a dialogue between is Islamic countries and, and, and the West. Uh, these are some of the stray thoughts that I have. And uh, later on, I can participate in the discussion, um, depending on the availability of time. I'll be brief, but a uh, <clears throat> couple of points that I want to make. First, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, we should not be reactive, but proactive. By that, I mean that uh, do we have an agenda on Kashmir that we want to put before the United States? Or do we expect the Biden administration to take initiative and tell us what to do on Kashmir? So I would suggest that uh, I'm in demonstrating adulthood. We should prepare our own brief, our own narrative, and engage the United States on Kashmir. What can be that agenda? That agenda is that the United States should intervene and stop India from committing genocide and crimes against humanity in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir. The United States is bound by international law, international humanitarian law, uh, the Geneva Conventions. Um, in fact, the United States considers itself to be the custodian of all these laws. So it has a responsibility not only as a preeminent nation, but also as a member of the Security Council. Your second question or second part of your question is whether or not Pakistan would prefer 
uh, bilateral solution or a multilateral solution. Pakistan and the people of Jammu and Kashmir prefer a multilateral solution. We believe in multilateral diplomatic solution, a solution which was already handed uh, some seven decades ago by the United Nations in the form of a plebiscite to be held under the auspices of the United Nations. Some people would say that this is anachronistic, that this is something hap which happened in the past and these resolutions have not been implemented, but they are a starting point. They are a democratic solution and Kashmiris are being punished for the past seven decades because they want to exercise their political will. Now, that's why I would say that when we talk about multilater multilateralism, we talk about the multilateral um, uh, forums like the United Nations Security Council, also Human Rights Council. But I would also like to point out that we should project to the rest of the world that there are three parties to the dispute. Pakistan, India, and the people of Jammu and Kashmir, and that the people of Jammu and Kashmir are key constituent to this dispute. They are the ones who have to decide their future and destiny. And uh, the United Nations is also associated because it was the one which handed down a uh, dispensation, a judgment which has yet to be implemented. Um, so I would say that if there is mediation, um, I firmly believe having been president of uh, Azad Jammu and Kashmir for the past four years, the one of the reasons that we haven't found a solution uh, to the Jammu and Kashmir dispute is that the representatives of Kashmir have never sat um, around the negotiating tables, whether they were multilateral negotiating tables or multilateral negotiating tables in Delhi or Islamabad or in New York. And, uh, you know, the United States, after all the opposition to the Taliban, sat with the United, uh, these Taliban representatives face to face. Uh, they were considered pariah, Taliban were considered pariah, but still when it came to a solution, a solution suiting the United States, they uh, sat across the table with Taliban. So what I want to say is a, not a bilateral solution because bilateral solution or bilateral engagement between India and Pakistan for the past many decades, starting from 1972, has been, as a matter of fact, a hoax, a mirage. And India has used it as, a, as an instrument of policy to buy time and to consolidate its occupation in the territory. Uh, I don't foresee any uh, escalation in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir or uh, between Pakistan and India because of uh, the uh, envisaged developments in Gilgit Baltistan. But well, let's try to understand what the people of Gilgit Baltistan are saying. For years, they've been saying that they should be given a provincial status. They already have a chief minister, they have a governor, they fly the flag of Pakistan. And uh, if you go to Gilgit Baltistan, uh, go to Gilgit and Skardu and meet people there from all political parties, they would tell you unanimously that they acceded to Pakistan back in 1947-48. And uh, the instruments of accession that the center Pakistan have not yet been responded by the successive governments of Pakistan. Um, the parties in Pakistan, political parties of Pakistan are also unanimous about giving a provincial status to Gilgit Baltistan. The parties in Azad Jammu and Kashmir, the political parties in Azad Jammu and Kashmir and uh, the old parties, Hurriyat Conference, the two representatives of Kashmiris in the Indian occupied territory, they have been counseling the people of Gil Gilgit Baltistan and also their leadership uh, not to change its status because this might imperil um, the status of Kashmir in the United Nations. But uh, the Gil people of Gilgit Baltistan are saying that they are uh, as staunch Kashmiris as uh, Kashmiris from Azad Kashmir and the occupied territory are. All they want, they say, is uh, their full rights, uh, civil liberties, fundamental freedoms, constitutional rights, and uh, integration with Pakistan. Right now on the agenda, although nothing has been cast in stone yet, Right now, on the agenda is a provincial, uh, a provisional province, not a constitutional province, which means that uh, while it will have, uh, Gilgit Baltistan will have the trappings of a province, it would not be a full fledged province. And therefore, that 
uh, international dimension of uh, Gilgit Baltistan status uh, as part of the uh, larger territory of Jammu and Kashmir would be kept intact. What I can foresee is that if this uh, uh, status is changed, there would be appropriate caveats and qualifications. For instance, say that uh, uh, this territory or the people of this territory would be subject to a plebiscit or subject to a solution that would be um, decided by or implemented by the United Nations or something to that effect. There would be a reference to the resolutions, um, the resolutions that are already there. So, but your question was not this, I just elaborated it. Your question was whether or not there's a risk of escalation. Escalation has already taken place. There are 900,000 troops deployed in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir and India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi and uh, uh, India's Defense Minister Rajnath Singh, they have threatened to take back Azad Kashmir militarily and they have also um, threatened Gilgit Baltistan. They have also objected to the China and Pakistan, China Pakistan economic corridor passing through Gilgit Baltistan. So the escalation, the kind of escalation that you're talking about is already there. Would it turn into conflagration between the two neighbors at a conventional or strategic level? I'd uh, rule that out for the time being, but the risk would remain there. Well, our stance on Kashmir or, or uh, the stance of the people of Jammu and Kashmir uh, has not been affected by some such aberrations. As a matter of fact, let me tell you that uh, uh, <clears throat> there's this strong sentiment in Azad Kashmir and in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir for accession to Pakistan. It was there in 1947 and uh, uh, it has been there throughout. It is there today. And that's why you would see um, the martyrs in Kashmir um, being buried in Pakistani flag. So I think that you can't compare the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir and Azad Kashmir. Let me tell you that uh, Azad Kashmir cannot be an equivalent of uh, the occupied territory because there are no killings here, there are no blindings here, no enforced disappearances, no fake encounters, no incarcerations, mass incarcerations. So this is a free land. And on the other side, you see genocide and you see war crimes being committed by the 900,000 troops. That's a prison. The people on that side of Kashmir are under siege. But at the same time, I would acknowledge that uh, uh, there is uh, a pro-independence sentiment. It was there in 1947. It is still there um, uh, today. But the fact is that India has banned JKLF, Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front, and its supreme leader, Yasin Malik, who is in Tihar jail. And on this side, in Azad Kashmir, uh, JKLF is free, and uh, other pro-independence elements, they can show up at the bars, at the press clubs, they can speak in the universities. So they are not muzzled, but uh, they, they're treated as traitors in the Indian occupied territory or in the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir. So what I'm saying is that we have shown a greater tolerance for dissent. Um, so I think that uh, it is democratic right of every citizen to express their views, but because of their views, we cannot sweep this uh, groundswell of support for accession to Pakistan under the carpet. Thank you for the closing statement. Well, you have a very flexible definition of 30 seconds, but uh, I'll um, present some one-liners. First is uh, the uh, Pakistan-United States relationship is very important within the overall framework of uh, Pakistan's foreign policy. Second, I would say build on convergences and reduce divergences between the United States and Pakistan. And uh, with the Biden administration, we have a new opportunity. Third, I would say that FATF and IMF and Afghanistan are all negative leverages. Try to create positive leverages. I would also like to say that uh, uh, we should um, create some sort of complementarity between the interests of the United States and Pakistan. And at the same time, we should avoid a dependency syndrome, either on the United States or on China. We will have to see whether the Biden administration would revive such initiatives as the Asia Pacific pivot 
the new Silk Road, which had been proposed by Hillary Clinton. And we will have to see what happens to the Quad. What is the future of Quad, which targeted Pakistan and China specifically? We must also realize that there is this raging arms race and uh, three-part competition uh, between China, uh, United States, and Russian Federation. Um, this arms race includes nuclear weapons. So we would have to see where this uh, race leads to. And my, my last two points are that in regard to Kashmir, in the beginning, we should uh, uh, have low expectations from the United States leadership because they would have other priorities, Iran, Korea, or uh, probably uh, some of the challenges that uh, they have. For instance, I can tell you that uh, uh, the day President Biden um, is, uh, 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 assumes his office, uh, two or three days later, this new treaty, which is called uh, um, Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, ratified by 50 countries, would come into force. That would create a new challenge, a new preoccupation for the United States and other nuclear weapon states. Last point is that for Pakistan, the most important, the most crucial challenge is its economy. If we are not economically viable, and if we do not uh, demonstrate economic growth and development, we would always remain vulnerable and no country on earth, including United States and China would be able to bail us out. 